joining in this uh, uh, session of the Leiden Delft Erasmus Center for Sustainability Circular Industries talks. Um, I'm, uh, I'm very happy that we, uh, we have David Molenaar today with us as a guest uh, speaker. Uh, David is uh, the CEO of Siemens Gamesa Renewable Energy. And um, I've uh, met um, uh, David on several occasions and, and every time I talk to him, I find it really inspiring because he's not, let's say, uh, a standard CEO of a large company in the sense that he has very um, interesting and also sometimes a bit radical maybe ideas about how to move forward in the realm of renewable energy and specifically, of course, in uh, in wind energy. And as we know, uh, not only the Netherlands has a very extreme and and and, and um, um, well um, hard to to uh, to get to goals if it comes to wind at sea. I mean, we're talking about 70 gigawatts in 2050, which is a huge increase from what we have now. And and, and David has some some very interesting ideas about how how we can actually reach that and what hurdles might be on the way and, and how we might be able to resolve that. So, um, uh, like I said, every time I talk to David, I was really inspired by by his well the different view he has on on how to how to do this. So I'm really happy that he was willing to uh, to make some time to join us today uh, in these uh, circular industries uh, talks and. Um, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, uh, just happy to, to, to offer you the floor, uh, David, and, uh, and, and take it away from you. Yeah, there is so, somebody with an open mic. Um, could you please close your mics and then David can uh, can start. Yeah, thank you, Renee, for the nice introduction. And of course, when I learned about the radical, that sounds uh, okay. <laughs> well, <Wow. laughs> um, maybe, maybe it's to, to, to start with. Um, it's, um, yes, I'm, I'm maybe atypical as CEO of a large company, um, although it's it's uh, it's limited to the Dutch, uh, to, to the Netherlands, where my role is. But at least I'm in this business for quite some time, and I hope that I can at least contribute to change the world a little bit. I would like to take you along through my presentation. You're happy to interrupt and ask questions. If I don't see your hand raised, please, then the Renee will step in and um, yeah, we'll, we'll ask questions. I love it to be interaction. Um, uh, what I'm telling you today, it's um, maybe that's radical. It started with my own ideas about how to move forward. And along the way, also try to convince my own company to do so. So it's, it's like finding that right balance, being a step forward, but also taking along your company with you because uh, sometimes you're stuck into a system and I think we need to go to a new system. So we need a system transformation, especially to uh, explore the North Sea. But I take you along and, and please um, feel free to interrupt and, um, and discuss. Um, my presentation is titled Do It By Design. Uh, you see in the picture, you see uh, one of our New project in the Asselmeer Lake. It's an uh, it's a direct drive turbine, nice overview taken by one of our technicians. And why do we have to do it by design? Because our pale blue dots needs help, and desperately. For the ones maybe not know, um, a long time ago in 1990 on, on Valentine's Day, uh, the Voyager One was launched, and um, after about six million kilometer distance from planet Earth. They asked them to turn, the NASA asked to turn around the camera and take a picture of the planet Earth, which you can see in the middle. So um, this illustrates that we are quite alone in this enormous space. So we have to be very cautious about our dear planet. Um, this one underlines that one, uh, the next decade of indecision could be decisive. Uh, I think it's important that we take decisions uh, based on climate reports information and we have to change something. Um, why is that? And that's my personal belief. Why I'm working and why I'm working with a smile is that two elements. One, I would love to leave the planet in a better way and a better shape than I found it. And two, while doing so, have some serious fun. For me, fun is cycling on the beach and taking to a dive into the North Sea once in a while. Um, and then when you look to the left, so you see a purpose swimming. Uh, that's that's cool. So for me also as an individual, also working at the company, I think it's important where you where you live, what you do, take care about the people around you, but also about the environment. Uh, so I think we have more in common than sometimes the company objectives uh, imply. Um, 
finally about the message I always gave to the employees, but also to our um, um, yeah, to students and, and schools. Um, for the ones not knowing, this is an app from the uh, the Dutch uh, police department and fire brigade. Um, when you're outside or outdoor and you don't know where you are, you need help. This one is very convenient. It sends your exact location to the uh, yeah, fire brigade or police or rescue department. And so you don't have to explain. I did the fall of my bike. It's uh, behind three X, Y, Z. You now it gives the exact location. And besides, you can also have a chat. So please install it on your phone. It's very convenient. It helps you uh, saving uh, people. And especially I know from, from my own experience, sometimes it's hard to tell where are you exactly. And when every second counts, it's uh, it's it's ideal to uh, to use this one. Um, moving on to to climate change and what I believe we should do. Uh, sometimes I use a report of big companies. This this time McKinsey, they wrote a report in September 20, and the key message was from this report that climate change is a threat to our lives and livelihoods. And at the same time, we have to change something and we have to reduce emissions. When I picture this to the Dutch situation and ask myself, are we progressing? And if you take this picture, these are the emissions um, in Holland. Starting in 1990 with 222 megatons at the current, at least the, uh, the situation in 2020 was around 180. Our targets are 100 in 2030 and in 2050 about 11. If you then do some simple math, you can see that in 40 year, in 30 years we have reduced minus 40 megatons, and in 2020 we have we had 10 years left, and we had to reduce minus 80 megatons. So roughly speaking, we had to speed up with a factor of six. Um, if you then take a closer look, what happened uh, around 2020? You can see that we did not change a lot in the emissions and especially that's also the reason why the Dutch government um, said we would love to reduce the emissions so that's why we they plan to reduce the coal fire power plants capacity to 35 percent we all know what happened um, this is in Dutch but at least uh, because of the crisis in the Ukraine um, they decided to put the coal fire power plants on fire again so it didn't help in reducing our emissions. From my company's perspective, we would love to design a fully recyclable turbine by 2040. Um, based on what you've seen before, I believe we have no time to waste. In two elements, one, we have to speed up. And the second part, we have to focus on what we do to produce no waste. Um, to illustrate that, um, is this a picture I made a couple of years ago where I tried to illustrate what happened over the past years in the wind industry. You know, in the early 70s, we had the, um, uh, the, the oil crisis, and I call this period until 2009 the donkey shot period. And uh, donkey shot was fighting against windmills, and then suddenly in 2009, we had a project Gemini, a 600 megawatt offshore project, but it was more or less the first power plant offshore. Then the industry focused on LCOE, levelized cost of electricity. We had to reduce the cost to uh, aim to reach the zero subsidy uh, goal. Yeah, because until that moment in time, wind was heavily subsidized and uh, it was also the public opinion. It didn't work. Uh, you need subsidy, they turn on subsidy, you need to, uh, they kill birds. It was quite negative. So what the industry did, we developed bigger turbines. When I started in the industry, uh, my first project was with a 1.5 megawatt size turbine and currently we're delivering 15 megawatt size turbine, so a factor of 10. And when we focused on aiming for zero subsidy, we reached zero subsidy in less than a decade. And what we now will see after the 2015, 16, 17, with the award of HKZ, Hollandske Zuid to Wattenfall, we, it was the first project worldwide without any subsidy, we now have to refocus. We reached our target, zero subsidy, and the next step will be zero waste. And why? We have to protect the people, the planet, and of course the profit of the, uh, the industry. So what we can do, we can introduce something like green steel, longer permits, moving targets on refuse, reuse, recycle, uh, that kind of targets, but also make a design that nature inclusive or that supports nature. And to zoom into that one, um, 
once more in uh, 2010, our prime minister said, eh, we demand spin on subsidy. So reaching zero subsidy was key to change perception. In 2017, uh, Minister Kamp, the former Minister of uh, Economic Affairs, said offshore wind is our biggest success. So if you can see if you believe in something, you set the right targets, it, it may work and you can change perception. So our new target is going for zero waste because we have reached zero subsidy. Um, the same picture, but now you see on the axis, you see uh, three triangles. In 2010, we had installed 96 turbines in the North Sea, at least in the Dutch part of the North Sea, in around 2020, 383. And you can see the target of 2030, around 1800. Currently, we are at around 575 installed turbines uh, today. And when the next project that has been tendered and awarded to uh, RWE and Shell Inigo, we will have installed around 800 turbines by 2027. That implies that we have to install 1,000 turbines in three years. Um, again, we have to speed up, so we do have to do something differently. Um, taking the same picture, but now making an, a, a line, you can see this is the uh, ramp up we have to do. Um, and the next phase is off scale. We have to install, based on the current targets of the Dutch government, 70 gigawatts in 2050. And Again, if you take if you look to this picture, you can see that until 2009 ish, when uh, we were in the shot period, and from 2009 ish to 2018, we had installed a limited number of turbines, uh, which required also a limited amount of subsidy. So for little money, we designed terms that are subsidy free. What you can see if we aim for having our turbines in 2040 recyclable, we have installed quite a few turbines that need yeah, that, that are not recyclable completely. Of course, 80, 85 percent we can recycle. But you can see the enormous pressure on raw materials, on our supply chain, on people. On So what we have to do now is to set the right targets to make sure what we will install in North Sea in the coming years can either be reused or with a longer lifetime, or we can, but we have to design it in such a way that it has a positive impact on, on the North Sea. So our advice to the uh, Dutch government was, OK, um, focus on a whole portfolio. So do not option an extender from a product, product point of view, but um, focus on the long term perspective across projects. Um, make sure that the industry is working on a level playing field, making sure that you add what you want to the tender criteria. Um, do it by design. The North Sea is a beautiful environment. And like I said, it's nice to slip into the North Sea into a clean and healthy North Sea. But when you only look at it from a perspective, we will install offshore wind farms. Uh, but you also can gain and, and harvest uh, food. It's also a recreational area. Uh, design it in such a way that you also can make the North Sea more healthy and more happy, meaning that you do it as an integral design, not only for the um, the purpose of energy, but also for food or for other elements. And I think the concept that will work best, and I will spend it in more detail later, is the zero, uh, is the moving targets concept, raising the bar step by step by step. And the other element is the tip height, which I've also explained a little later. This is the enabler of doing so. Um, moving towards the zero waste targets. Uh, like I said, in less than a decade, we have reduced or we have reached zero subsidy. And the key was that we set a target as an industry. Um, we said, OK, currently when we started in uh, with Gemini, sorry, we started with Gemini with a level of 168 euros per megawatt hour. And we set a target to reach 100. And we agreed with the government that we lowered the subsidy level step by step by step. But if you reach that level, you got the permit and you're allowed to build. So the key concept is that you challenge the industry. You say, OK, if you reach that target, you get the permit and you're allowed to build. Uh, but this target will be, you will raise the bar 
per project. So over time, you know, you have to do more. So it's not helpful if you wait because you need to learn from project to project to project. At the same time, also, you would love to um, make sure that you share across projects. So also we ask the government, please um, take responsibility, uh, carry out all the soil investigations for the North Sea and share that across projects because then you can really lower your technical risks from project to project to project. So we're now proposing to the, to the government, please include targets like the share of recyclable blades. Now it's more or less, uh, uh, it's a gadget. It starts uh, at the low level, so uh, we, we will equip a few turbines with recyclable blades, but not all. Uh, although we can produce, although the, the point is they are slightly more expensive from a capex point of view. So what we have to do is to make sure that when we start using recyclable blades, we have to set the targets that the first product maybe has 10% equipped with recyclable blades, but the next will be, will be 20 and so on until we reach 100%. The same is true with green steel. Um, you can still you can produce steel in many different ways, but we have to make sure that it's yeah in the end green. Maybe we have to have include targets like a CO2 footprint uh, for main components. Where do you get new material from? Do you yes or no include um, your whole transport and installation concept? At the same time, we also know hey, we have a lot of non virtual material. Uh, which is not used at the moment. We use a lot of virgin material. We mine a lot. We, we make sure that we have new materials. But the question is, okay, can you design it such that we can reuse the material we are using? And one example is uh, we use our inner turbines magnets based on neodymium. Uh, this is a, a rare earth material, which is uh, not rare in in, in terms of the, it's 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 abundant. But at least the, the way you have to mine it, it's quite intensive for nature and environment. So if we could design our mechanisms in such a way that we can, after the life, we can reuse them instead of we design it for one lifetime of a product. Um, also, we know from the whole industry, from the whole world, that only 8% of the materials we are using is being reused. So 92% is not being reused. So we have to change focus from my perspective on a level playing field that we say, okay, we have to make sure that what you use can be reused. Can I ask you something, David? Yes. What does a recyclable magnet look like? I mean, what is different from a regular magnet in a wind turbine? What should be done in order to make it recyclable? Now, that's a good question, Ray. It's, it's a matter of what is uh, the concept now is that we develop, uh, we focusing on, 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 a, on a generator with magnets mm -hmm. and we're using the best material we can find because this is a very high power to mass ratio because we are focused on lowering the cost of uh, of the level cost of electricity. If you would accept a higher cost price of electricity, then we can use different materials which are maybe less uh, have a less burden on the way we, we extract them from uh, from the, the earth. So it's a matter of OK, and also when we design it, we manufacture it in such a way that it has the best performance, but not how you can uh, take it apart. And for example, if you would standardize the, um, the size of the turbines, we can reuse them after the end of life. And maybe instead of selling our magnets to the utilities, for example, in the Eco Shell or RWE or Vattenfall, we can say you can lease them from us, but we know we get them back after this period of time and we can use them for the next generation. So it's a different philosophy. If you don't design it for reuse again, it's not designed for this purpose. It's sold, it's none of a problem, it just sent to our customers. Yeah, thank you. Benjamin, you raised your hand, I see. Yeah, so this is of course interesting, and I and I, we both work on, on this topic. So I was thinking, yes, you're really focusing on the magnet itself, but what I understand is that is if you want to recycle them, like really reuse, you need to standardize, etc. But just recycling requires that actually more on the um, assembly level, you don't glue everything stuck and weld everything shut, but you somehow have a way to have access to it. And, and that seems like something that's 100% in your hands and not when you say like, well, people need to help us to do things. Like, is it just 100% in your hands to make it more recyclable? Yes or no, but the point is if, if we, like I said, we the system we are living in is is based on 
lowest economic maximum economic value. And we are in highly competitive markets. So um, it's all focused about in our DNA, more or less, to produce at the lowest possible cost of electricity per megawatt hour. So let's say the one, one and only design criterion is now is lowest cost, lowest cost. And uh, for example, I give you a simple example about, uh, let's say, the supporting structure of our turbines is made out of steel. Um, with only 10 to 50 percent more steel, we can extend the lifetime for 25 to 40 years. If you then do a whole design cycle assessment about your lifetime assessment of your of your, your turbine, then the let's say the emissions per megawatt hour are much lower. To when you add some additional uh, material. However, nobody is doing that because the business case is only for 20 or 25 years because the permit is limiting that. So it's 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 finding a new way of thinking and instead of limited by business case, you need to have some non price elements that are important for the next generation of uh, of products. And yes, it's so true. We can change a lot. Yeah. So basically what you're saying, you need also regulation and, and uh, uh, well, the, the, the customers also to think along, basically, uh, and, and including the government to think along and and making it possible to indeed design them for for 50 years or 60 years. Yeah. It's not saying that we, that we don't take responsibility. It's more or less that uh, you need a new system, and in this system, yeah. there should be you know, a reward for non-price elements. Exactly. Uh, otherwise, yeah. you, you always lose in this, this highly competitive market. Yeah, and, and, and interesting because we we, we met at at the Parkhuis Zwijger, where also the, the the lead, let's say, of the Ministry of Economic Affairs was 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 there as he was talking about the ambitions, etc. And one thing things he was talking about is that they were actually now struggling with how to include circularity aspects in let's say granting the the the, the permits, etc. Et, et and and so. So I guess you were also talking to them. I'm, I'm sure you are, uh, uh, because they they actually can put it, yeah, put the regulations in place that might help you to actually make these design changes, right? Yes, exactly. And, and to give you a very very simple example, I think next this week will be on the agenda of the Dutch Wind Energy Association. Uh, uh, I think one thing I proposed, a very simple measure. It's not linked to materials, but linked to people. What we can see is that. The number of students on MBO level, so vocational level, is decreasing, and especially also within the, within this group, the number of students that do a technical course is decreasing. But those are the ones we need to execute the energy transition, both at your homes but also in the industry. And talking to a lot of schools, and that's a little bit a little bit a joke is, but I think five years ago I had a, a birthday party where I met one of the lecturers of an MBO college in, in, uh, in Hofdorp and I asked him, can, can I please give a guest lecture uh, to your uh, um, students about offshore wind? And, he, and it was a flight mechanics school. So it's, no, no, David, uh, your terminals doesn't fl don't fly, so we're not interested. In COVID, the KLM sent all the apprenticeship home because they could not do anything good. So they, he reached out to me against David, we need about 100 apprenticeship positions to for our students. So I said, OK, um, uh, what, what we can do, we will help you to um, to to make the NVA aware of the situation. And we try to establish a new situation where we um, where we find uh, apprenticeship positions for your students. But why, what I learned as well is that to invest in students, you need also to invest in trainings and GWL trainings, uh, fire rescue, uh, sea survival. It costs about three and a half thousand euros. So it's a big investment for students for only uh, one course. So what I'm now proposing to the government is to include as a uh, a target, at least of as a um, tender criterion, is to have when you got awarded a project, over the lifetime of the project, you are obliged to have at least a few students positions available and you pay for the training. Because then the system starts working, it becomes a contractual obligation. This contractual obligation is into in the budget, so it's the system starts working, and the, the students know. Okay, we have positions. The schools know we have a uh, so many positions available. So then, the system starts working, and I'm looking to systems that that we change from system A to system B, and then it must be uh, self-sustaining. And the same is true with. All this kind of regulation does it help to make it uh, to a change to the system and a structural change to the system? 
And yes, we can change a lot as a company, but also we are, yeah, we are more or less in this system of designing for lowest cost and limited, uh, yeah, uh, limited period of time. But we have to escape from this, uh, the current system. So how do you then see the, um, in the upcoming tenders, there's a circularity aspect, right? They added it, but it's not yeah. quite clear what exactly they want. So I guess it's more like a, a test to yeah. see what industry comes up with, or how do you how do you see that? Yeah, um, maybe if you allow me to continue for one or two slides, then I, then it can, I can make it more uh, more explainable. Um, what I said, and, and and for me the enabler to to all start all of this is is setting a maximum tip height for our turbines. Uh, like I said, uh, to reach zero subsidy, we increased our size for turbines from 1.5 megawatt to 15. Uh, the rotor diameter from, let's say, 70 meters to 236 meters. So it's a big jump. And uh, this is a presentation I gave uh, in, in 2019 with uh, the, the current situation in, 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 the, in the permits is, is the tip height of 251. At that time discussing 301, but it came 304. Um, but if you, this is the picture you can see uh, the, the monopolins in, into the seabed, you see the waves, there's a 25 meter clearance between the mean sea level and the lower tip for safety reasons. And there's a currently a 1000 feet limit. It's about 304 meters for the uh, Holland's Coast West uh, project. And what I propose to the government, if you use those uh, limitations, you can design a 20 megawatt size plus turbine. But if you say, and that's what we're trying to do to the government to convince them, please make sure that this level is there for the next decade, because that implies that you can start investing in equipment that can install it. And for the ones not familiar with wind energy, but wind energy is watts per square meter. So if you fix your maximum tip height and you have your lower clearance defined, your rotor is defined. I mean, your rotor is defined, your squared uh, area, your swept area is defined, meaning that your maximum power output is defined and also your maximum loads. That implies that you can design your supporting structure, meaning the tower and lower, for not only 20 years, maybe for 60 years. You can design your cables and your substage for 60 years. So a longer depreciation period, uh, you don't have to decommission and remove. And maybe in, in the parts that, that will have a more potential to have more innovation, like the rotor blades or the, the nacelle, yeah, can have a lower uh, period of time that you can use. So in, in this perspective, you can, with setting only one tip height limitation, you can design your structure in a different way, but then you can add this, uh, this more material to your supporting structure that can last longer with a lower footprint on, on CO2 emissions. And like I said, with 10 to 15 minutes more steel, you can extend your lifetime for 25 to 40 years. And as you know, that 40% of the CO2 footprint of um, per kilowatt hour is, is originating from steel. You can lower your, your footprint a lot. So this for me is the enabler to speed up. And if you have started this one, also the installation contractors can design a vessel which can install turbines to this level. Normally they design a vessel, then a crane, and this crane is within two years time obsolete because the, the turbine is getting bigger. So if you'd like to make speed, and like I said, we have to speed up with a factor of six. And in terms of, uh, yeah, we have to go to warp speed. You need to make sure that you can do now the investments and also in key sites, in, in cranes, in equipment and in, uh, infrastructure. So that you can speed up. So my key plea to the customer is, is, is to can please set a step height for a sufficient long period of time, such that the industry can industrialize. And um, this is now true for the uh, the next tender for Amai de Ver. We reached that point, but it's only for a few years time, and we try to extend that. And to give you also an impression about uh, how is our industry doing, and especially this is a statement from a former Ursula Femoti chief, that uh, no one is making money, we have to industrialize. Uh, you can see, also see it from Vestas. Um, and we, we must slow down turbine development to speed up the rollout. Um, it's another picture from K2 management. Um, and again, uh, again, something from Vestas uh, happening. Inico, one of the main contractors, is stating 
the freeze your rotor diameter for the next five to ten years uh, to a certain level. And um, and maybe the most striking one is this one is a report from DMV, DMV Jail. Uh, they assess the impact of standardization of industrialization. In this graph on the right hand side, you see the red dashed one. This is the cost of energy of the level cost of energy. And you can see on the uh, X axis the turbine size rating from 12 to 30 megawatts. And what you can see is that more or less. Yeah, I'm not sure what the accuracy is, but at least it's it's more or less stable from from 12 to 24 and then slowly the cost of energy getting up. So my conclusion with this report was as well. Uh, we're now more or less at the junction. You can go left you can start building and designing bigger turbines with more complex materials, including carbon uh, designing for only for bigger and not 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 uh, lower impact that in the end, maybe cost of energy will increase. If you take the duration um, and you take the yes, a uh, very practical question. So, so I see this 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 cost uh, curve for uh, increased turbine size. Is it so that you can have that you can get more kilowatt hours per square kilometer with larger turbines than with smaller turbines? Um, yeah, in, in 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 the past, of course, we said we need yeah, you need less. Uh, structures. Uh, the, the, the bigger the turbine, the less structures you need, the more efficient it is, and that's true. Um, but that's efficiency, but just in 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 kilowatt hours per square kilometer, because that is a limiting factor, right? I mean, we have limited space in 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 the North Sea, though, so that could be an additional reason why you would want to have larger turbines, because then in total you can generate more energy. That that's one way to look at it. it. <laughs> <laughs> um, the question is, can we produce that, and can we scale up the whole industry? And 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 what I can see, and for my, I'm in this world for more than 20 years now, and I've seen every time this, the scale up and the scale up and scale up. Which I truly believe. Uh, what I can see is that we are um, we have developed too fast. Uh, we the, the whole supply chain can't keep up, and if one part of the of let's say the whole chain that must work can uh, can do it and you can demonstrate okay we have we can develop a bigger turbine and indeed you need less uh, square meters to to have the maximum performance however if you can't have the supply chain keeping up and you have not the people and so it's it's the whole system must work and i truly believe that and what you can see maybe it's less efficient from that perspective but in the end if you have more frequent failures or you have more problems or uh, so we have to do, look at it from a different perspective, and I think the key perspective is that we have to change our target view. And the target is not lowest cost or most efficient use of the limited uh, space we have. It's about waste, because we will hit the barrier of not having the materials, or being getting scarce, or or or, or we use materials but we can't design them for reuse, or so. We have to change our way of thinking, and uh, I know that's hard after many, many, many years of of, of focusing on a different part. But yes, um, yeah. and also people said to me, David, that if you now you, you make now a plea for limiting the turbine size, but what if we have done that ten years ago? Then we wouldn't would never have reached zero subsidies. No, that's true. But we now have reached zero subsidies, so we now have a different. We now in a different era, yeah. and. So in this graph, you can see that that if you take the junction and we continue to to make bigger turbines, most likely the cost of energy will stay stable or potentially increase. What we do know that we never have used the industrialization element, and what we do know from industrialization is that we can lower the cost or we can reduce the risk. So for me, it's like if you have two options, either you go left, or you go right. With left, you're not sure what will happen. It might get cheaper, but also might get more expensive. And we take the right turn. You know for sure you will have a lower cost of electricity, but also at the same time, you enable the roots of designing turbines for zero waste. So for me, it's quite evident. Please take this right turn and uh, set the right target. Um, so from my perspective is why not? And um, they get into all kind of discussions. Uh, we have to decide now is that what if we only do it from a Dutch perspective? Uh, we only have uh, the, the, the Dutch government is the owner of the uh, of the seabed, so they can decide. But what if 
the remainder of the North is not supporting that. What about the European level? What about the global level? And my reply is, of course, it, it's a risk that uh, that the outside world is uh, is developing bigger turbines. But then we have to focus on where are we good at? It's it's not only levelized cost, but also quality. It's also about the way we deal with uh, people, the way what kind of labor conditions we have. So all kind of non-price elements we should include to make sure that we have a, a, a stable market. And um, from this perspective, I think it's important to note is that if we, um, we also have to speed up every day we wait installing those turbines, we have to do more the next day because it's the, uh, and maybe to go back to the, one of the first slides, I think it's slide number four. I was muted. I saw yes. Um, whatever reason. Now, if you look, if you go back to this slide where uh, you see the uh, 11 megatons uh, in 2050, the are the remainder of the target, which you have to reach in 2050. If you do know now that 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 Tata still is producing emitting now currently 12.6 megatons, so um, it's really a serious challenge we have to do as a whole industry to reduce. So, on every day we wait installing. Um, low emission power plants, we have to do more the next day. So also in terms of uh, we can design bigger terms, we can install them. However, not at the speed we have to reach because uh, we have to. Uh, and also now for my, my project, the first term takes the longest. But if you have it running, you can do a few terms a day and it's worry free, it's stable and also in, the, in terms of maintenance and operation. So from my perspective, it is I know we have reached a beautiful industry by focusing on lowest cost, but now the time has changed to focus on designing for zero waste. And at the same time, if you look to our new North Sea, please design it in such a way that we have green energy, clean erectons, but also green molecules, but at the same time designing for co-use, designing for reinforcing nature. What can we do as an industry to add elements that will help uh, supporting and uh, yeah, reviving the, the North Sea from a flora and fauna perspective and also designing it for a recreational perspective. So let's take a blank sheet of paper and what should we do to redesign the North Sea such that in 20 years time we look back and say we have done a good thing. We don't forget what we've done today, but we will uh, we'll make it happen. So. And by that was the main point is to the end is that. So I said to the government, please help me by having this, this uh, maximum tip height installed. And I asked them to say, why not uh, decide now? Because uh, yeah, let's aim to leave the planet in a better shape than we found it. And while doing so, uh, yeah, dare to have some serious fun because in the end, that's that's most important if you have fun. It's easier to uh, yeah, to reach out to people to discuss and uh, don't be shy to um, don't uh, dare to share, at least in that perspective. Thank you. That's uh, it, Rene. Thank you, David. Uh, for, I'll give you a hand. I, I can give you a hand that you can hear and there might be some virtual hands as well. So thank you very much for this uh, great presentation, uh, David. I think it's a. Uh, uh, yeah, I think it's a, a huge challenge that we are the other that we are confronted with. Uh, we can also see that when talking to people from the ministry, I mean, it's a daunting task, task to get to this 70 gigawatts. I know it's it's not a goal, uh, but it's kind of the, the the upper limit, let's say, of the goal. But but still, I mean, it's a, a enormous um, increase that we need. And I, I, yeah, I really understand your your plea to go circular. I mean, that is something that we have been working on the circular industry hub, of course. That these are huge uh, uh, machines and it's the new part and the, the new energy system basically is taking care of 
the resources that we have and the, the, the stocks that we have in society in, in wind turbines, but also in solar cells and batteries and electric vehicles. We have to make sure that we take care of all those materials in order to make sure that the, the system in itself be, uh, remains sustainable. So, so thanks for, for, for highlighting that and, and thanks also for uh, coming up with some very practical proposals. And I know that you are discussing this also with, uh, with the ministry, so I'm hoping that we can move forward there. Um, Anybody that has a question, please raise your hand. I can already see one hand raised, and that is Bernard. So please, Bernard, to uh, take the floor. Yeah, hi, David. Uh, Bernard, uh, a really great presentation. I, I think very useful uh, for us CMLOs uh, to, to have a complementary perspective on all of that that's going on in, in, in the industry and, and, and other constraints uh, on, on wind energy. Um, I have one comment and three questions. I hope that is okay. Um, the the comment is uh, we just published a paper that uh, offshore wind energy can actually have positive effects on biodiversity. So if you're interested in that, we're happy to share that. Uh, that's that's yes, work yes. Of, of Chen Li, who, who is also uh, here today. Um, then my questions are, uh, you talked about recyclability. Um, are there any blade materials that can be fully recyclable or what, what kind of materials are you thinking of when uh, you, you mentioned even 100% recyclability in, in the future? Um, and do we talk about closed loop or open loop recycling? Uh, that's question one. Question two is I'm really curious, you, you talked also about co-benefits uh, or sharing the space maybe and then uh, offshore floating solar came to my mind so i'm curious to think uh, to to hear what you uh, think about that uh, and the third one is um which questions would you have to an institute like cml so how can we uh, support you uh, Lead tough questions <laughs> um, sorry for that no, no, no that, that, that's that I like it. Um, the second one about floating solar in between. Um, I'm always a little bit hesitant to to using floating solar um, because if you have been offshore and you see the circumstances um, that that are quite tough. Um, to give you an example, uh, on Gemini we have the platform level. I think 20 meters above sea level, 25 meters above sea level. And we have some stainless steel stairs to go from the platform to the turbine. And five, six millimeters thick. And sometimes we uh, we see them that they are lifted for half a meter because of a slamming wave uh, and uh, bumping into the, to the monopile and then going up. So I'm a bit reluctant, although I know there are some good um, um, Test ongoing, uh, so I think the combination should be uh, can work. However, it will be technically challenging. But of course, I will not say it cannot be done. But at least I'm reluctant. Um, and also, I'm not sure what is the impact on the uh, the, the life below if you blocking the the, the 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 sunlight into the sea. But from we have to investigate. But I'm a little bit more reluctant than to use it. I think from solar perspective, I prefer that we would design our uh, roofs of houses and flats in such a way or integrating into the buildings that that should be. Yeah, sounds to me more, uh, more, more, more promising. So reluctant, I don't say no, but at least it's, it's challenging. And um, yeah, that's one part. And especially I think the, the better combination is, is, uh, is wind and hydrogen. So you have a strong combination uh, reusing the existing uh, gas pipelines and, and using the combination of wind and, 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 uh, and hydrogen. The third one, how can, you, uh, how can you help? I think be very critical what I'm telling and I'm giving feedback. To me, it's, it's like also exploring what can I tell, what can't, what can't I tell and what is, is, is the way forward, but also staying pragmatic uh, because understanding we are in a system, we have to change the system. And we have to make steps forward, but also I'm yeah, uh, helping us and especially what you uh, I think Bernard asked uh, or no, we asked it uh, about the. Um, how do you develop circularity criteria and we have to make it very 
pragmatic and practical, but also that must work and it must, must change the structural way of thinking. So helping us in a way, in a very good discussion, what will be the best criterion to use? And then as an industry, agree on that topic and then implement it and just then use it for a long period of time. And then seeing and then checking the structural change. So yeah, for me, it's being uh, discussions, maybe uh, shared students uh, to, to cross borders between uh, that also helpful, different ideas, being open minded to that. that that's that's really helpful. And the first one was about, I forgot, about circularity and, and um, yeah, our blades are designed, I think it's a combination of glass fiber, uh, the balsa wood and some resin. And what we now did is that we um, made a resin that can be, um, it can be heated up and in, in an acid, acid bath we can extract it again after lifetime. And then we have the balsa wood and we have the glass fiber back. What we do not know yet is what is the remaining strength of the of the glass fiber. So we do have the original material, but we do not know what is, will be the original strength after 20 years of lifetime. Of course, we're also working on different materials, but the key thing is, is that for me and as a former sportsman, I think we have to set a challenge and set the target. Okay, we would love to develop those kind of blades. And um, so it's now developed based on the most lightweight blade with the least material, which is based on strength and stiffness and flexibility, but not on reusing the original materials. So it's a design philosophy change. And for example, if we would would like to build a bigger rotor, we should in, we must include, uh, for example, uh, maybe more carbon. And it's even hard to separate. And I know that Julie Turbans had a lecture uh, before Christmas, and she had a different philosophy. She said, David, if you design, let's say, the core of your blade such that you can reuse that as a beam for using bridges, and only the outer part is it's given the aerodynamical shape, you can use a different material. So you design it, let's say, for two purposes. One is it, it's, it lives for 20 years in a turbine, and after that it can stay for 50 years in, as a, let's say, the beam of a bridge. This kind of aspect we have to include. So it's more or less a different philosophy. And I'm quite convinced if we set the right target that we can design it such that it's, 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 it, you have a different result. It has never been designed for use or for, um, yeah. What you can also now see is these efforts of uh, people like from Superuse Studios. Uh, so they are designing, let's say, um, sound walls that are placed next to highways made out of turbine blades. They're uh, very much suited to actually uh, to, to have that purpose. Now, of course, in the end, you would want to recycle the material and, and if you could reuse it be better. But this is also kind of a reuse of not say, let's say the glass fiber, but of the, the structure as it is. So it retains even more value, you could argue, if you use it in that way. And that would actually be an application because one of the questions, they also make, for example, playgrounds out of wind turbine blades. And that's great, but there's not enough playgrounds to actually uh, uh, yeah. get all these turbine blades in. But but these sound barriers, they can actually absorb basically all the waste that we have from, from wind turbine blades for a very long time um so that is that is a, well that's I, I also find that kind of efforts interesting although i am worried about end of life of the sound barrier and what happens then with the materials but in principle it's it's well it's a higher end use basically of the material yeah, yeah. yeah the most important i mean what, what we would be most beautiful if we design our beds such that after 20 years they go back there being shredded and being reused to use the 3D printer and use them again. Yeah. Um, but it requires, it starts with the philosophy. How do you design it? And what are your design criteria? For example, if you have the option to use material A and B, yeah. and they are more or less material A, uh, you would select based on uh, strength and stiffness um, conditions. Yeah. But material B is more attractive from a, a circularity perspective. Then always material A will be selected. So right. we have to change that that way of thinking, and also that means that in, in at schools at the universities, uh, it, it's a it's the whole end to end philosophy should be taken into account, and not only limited lifetime within this business case. Thanks. I see that Benjamin so raised his hand. 
Yes. Okay. Hello. So I just don't want to come back to this. So what I feel like a lot of the things that you are um, saying here are quite maybe not absurd, but quite long term, right? Like these really long term agreements with the government about the whole structure of the system, which is all really important and it sounds really um, convincing. But at the same time, if you look at what's happening now in the next few years, you know, the, the structure seems to be to have these tenders. <clears throat> and every time if you talk to the civil servants, they say, yeah, they have the tender ISO instead. I don't know what the English word is. We, in the tenders, we have certain uh, specifications that you need to kind of reach and kind of broader specifications, especially now with circular economy. Um, ISO, oh, Rene, what's what's a good word for tender ISO in English? Tender requirements. Uh, tender requirements. Yeah, they're quite broad, so they they leave it up to the industry to kind of fill it in a bit because I think this is speculation, but because the, the civil service also don't really know exactly what hard uh, tender requirements to do there. But this kind of seems to be not the same route as what you're sketching. You're saying sketching, make this really large agreement for the next 20 years with the government. And the government is saying, ah, oh, you know, we're going to every time we do a tender, we're going to increase the requirements a little bit, but kind of vague. But still, like a step in the right direction. How do you see that process, and what do you think? What are possibilities inside that structure? No, I'm actually I'm quite happy the way we are as an industry working with the government. It is like they are very open to these kind of ideas and discussions. And I think, and we made quite a big progress. Um, the, the question is, that at least what I'm raising my hand of raising the flag. I said, please, and we are speeding up so fast. We have to speed up so fast that. If we don't set the right requirements today, then we will face it in a few years' time. And um, and of course, uh, what you also see in this international environment, I, I painted a picture for Holland with about it, this 1,000 tombs in three years' time. It also holds true for the UK and for Germany and for Belgium and for France. So um, that's why I also told the government, please, uh, if you would like to make sure that you, you will reach your, your national targets on, on climate change, then you must award as soon as possible those projects, because then the industry can, can plan, can award, can continue. If you are too late, and um, then uh, you're lost. And the other element is, of course, they, they are a bit reluctant in a way, okay, but what if we have our requirements are too strong, then maybe the big utilities will install in the other country. So it's a careful balance, also a little bit about fear. I believe in, in strength. If you if you set the right target and you have an early award, you can plan and schedule, and it's more that has more value. Uh, and I think if you they explored with the new the, the past tenders what can happen, there are many, many, many ideas originally from the industry. What we now have to do is to select a few which you really carry through. Uh, instead of keeping on exploring. Now we have a good ideas and just implement them step by step by step in a very structured way. And that's, uh, but I'm really happy the way the government is, is, is dealing with us and dealing with industry here is open, open minded. Um, so. Good, thanks. Interesting. Thanks. Uh, Sander. Yeah, I have a question related to uh, what was just discussed. Also about the well, the tendering. Um, well, and I see that well, the, you make good arguments for using uh, well, using these criteria when there are tenders. Um, but I wonder what what's your view on the use of um, LCA-based assessment of well, uh, in in tenders. So not using only the price as the well minimal price, but also minimal environmental impact using, for example, the uh, milieu cost indica indicator uh, or similar approaches, because this is also being used in several other, uh, well, sec uh, government um, tenders. Um, yeah, so my question is, if you see this could also help to find well not only focus on price indeed and whether it would well be beneficial or not compared to these criteria that you described. 
Uh, I, I fully agree. I think I'm not I'm not so much involved in, in, in uh, about this this how objective those assessments are. I mean, uh, for me, it's really important that this that is transparent. Uh, and when you have an objective assessment of your product, and especially about the let's say the your footprint per kilowatt hour of what you're doing, then it uh, and then it's helpful to focus on that. In the end, it, it's it, we started with the fact we have to reduce the CO two levels in the atmosphere. So this should be the key objective to reach that one. You should assess that on those elements because we have to reduce those emissions. So this should be key, but we should not forget that we have other criteria to be used, but at least this one is the main one. And if we would have a, let's say, an objective criterion where we can assess the whole industry and we can also differentiate that you, for example, can, uh, I believe in an integral objective. And if you as an uh, individual party can say, okay, we either extend the lifetime by five years or we use different vessels, but we can reach the same point. I'm happy. So at least have an integral constraint. Normally I tell that uh, use a shoe box on your location on site, specify what should be, let's say the emissions outside the shoe box. And then, um, but how you do that as an industry, leave it up to the industry, leave also the flexibility to be innovative. And it can be by offering longer lifetimes, can be using different vessels or can be, but at least don't be too specific on technology or on, but be very specific of what you'd like to reach. Set the right target. And if that's a clear, if there's a model for assessing the life cycle uh, impact of uh, green electricity, then please use it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it is quite objective. And in the construction industry, they have also good experience with using this indicator. Yeah. Thank you, and 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 thank you all. Um, uh, I'm afraid this is all that we have time for today. So I would like to thank you again, uh, David, for uh, for sharing your uh, your ideas and your uh, uh, and and, and uh, giving your talk here in this uh, circular industry sub. I'm uh, I'm really sure that we will be uh, talking uh, soon again somewhere else in some other setting. Um, interesting stuff, very important stuff, I think, in order to 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 get to the goals that we all want to get to. Um, and uh, yeah, just thanks again. Thank you, uh, May, and uh, to the uh, to the audience. Please, if you would like something, please reach out to me. Know, knows how to find me, and then uh, stay in touch and keep yep. up the good work. Okay, thank you. Bye bye. Hi. Bye bye.